account due to the COVID-19 pandemic. With the world's second largest economy shrinking 6.8% in the first quarter, its prospects for the second quarter are in the global spotlight. So what are the numbers? What measure will the government uh, take to boost the economy? And what effects will the continuing pandemic and the resulting global slowdown have going forward? To discuss these issues and more, I'm pleased to be joined via satellite by Hong Hao, Chief Strategist of Bank of Communications International in Hong Kong, and via Skype by Professor Zhu Min, Deputy Director of the National Institute of Financial Research, Tsinghua University. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Xu Qinduo. Well, economic performance. Let's take a look at this. You know, the Chinese figures here by the National Bureau of Statistics shows that for the first quarter, there is actually a contraction by 6.8%. So I won't have your take on that. Are you surprised with the, de with the decline? So Hong Hao, please. Yeah, well, I don't think anyone is surprised at all. Before the number was released, um, there was a very wide range of uh, market expectation, uh, ranging you know, between plus 3 to 4 percent to minus 11, 12 percent. So I think 7 percent is right in the middle of the range. And you know, because uh, Lunar New Year traditionally is a, a low season for the Chinese economy, uh, and also in, in February and March, uh, the, company, uh, the country is mostly shut down. So I think 6.8% is actually a very respectable number considering we lost almost two months in the first quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Zhu Min, uh, do you agree it's a respectable number, 6.8%? Uh, yes, I tend to uh, uh, concur with uh, House assessment in I think China's economy is actually doing quite well uh, in light of the COVID-19 uh, virus situation. Uh, that being said, I think it, given the... Uh, uh, the dynamics of the virus situation, I think it's a little bit too early to say, well, what we're going to see for the next few quarters, especially given what is going on with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at the, uh, the detailed numbers in different sectors. For example, China's retail sales of consumer goods, a major indicator of consumption uh, growth, you know, declined 19% year on year in the first quarter. So that's a big decline, 19%. So uh, how do you see such a drop in growth? I mean, consumption is one of the pillars of Chinese economy. Are we going to see it tick up uh, somewhat in the next quarter as you know, the country is basically reopening the economy in the full uh, mansion, uh, full probably full dimension? That's uh, Professor Zhu Min. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm actually not that surprised. I and mean, when uh, there was a big lockdown in uh, the Hubei province, and also there was social distancing programs going on for the entire nation. So uh, it's not just a matter of uh, people have less income or it was the holiday season. It is also because there are less uh, scenario for people to go out and to spend the money. So this shouldn't be too surprising. And I do expect the uh, consumption numbers to pick up in the near future. And I, th I think there are two reasons. One is as the resumption of work and there are more and more people going back to their regular life and there will be more consumption opportunities. And in the meantime, I think the government has been rolling out a series of uh, programs which are aiming at providing uh, assistance and uh, uh, consumption coupons, which will also stimulate the consumption uh, in the near future. So basically, you are, when we, it comes to these coupons, the consumption coupons, it, uh, refer, you are referring to like cities at the, I mean, at the state level, provincial level, or cities. It's not the state level. Is it likely uh, you know, for the Chinese government to issue a nationwide uh, practice, you know, consumption coupons to everybody or every household to stimulate the, the consumption? Professor Zhu. I, I think it's not entirely impossible. However, there are two considerations one have to take into uh, account. One is, well, given China's larger population, uh, even if we're going to provide those uh, coupons, it will not be a huge number given the large number of uh, population base. The second thing is there are still certain technological or uh, logistic uh, challenges for people to, uh, for everyone to receive that coupon. So I think it's not impossible, but I think there will be a lot of uh, challenges in implementing a nationwide stimulus. So I think the regional based uh, programs are probably more effective or more available uh, in the near future. 
Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Hong Hao, how about that? You know, like uh, you provide uh, by the state such a consumption coupon to those people, low-income people, so uh, to help them weather over this difficult time. At the same time, you stimulate a little bit the consumption. Yeah, well, I think it's meaningful uh, in the sense that it really help out um, people who really need um, a consumption coupon. You know, because um, after all. Unemployment rate uh, in urban area actually increased uh, slightly to 5.8 percent from previously 4. Point something percent. Uh, so I think you know there are you know some need and also uh, most likely than not uh, the urban unemployment rate may have um, underestimated uh, the unemployment situation. You know because it only recognized those people who registered themselves as unemployed. Uh, so I think you know many people probably couldn't be bothered can't even make it to the registration office. Uh, so I would say that you know coupon is better, and also it's probably work faster than the uh, uh, the tax reduction or tax rebate, uh, in a sense that uh, people tend to save the the tax reduction uh, rather than spend it. But if you give them uh, actual coupon, uh, it's more likely than not they're going to use it and exchange it for goods. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned uh, the job market, uh, the uh, unemployment situation. So the latest figure is like a five. 0.9% actually is a bit down uh, by 0.3 percentage yeah. points from the previous uh, uh, month, February. So as a, we know as a practice, China sets a job creation target of over 10 million new positions each year. I mean, how challenging would it be for this year? Uh, would be very challenging. Uh, I think the number before this 6.2% uh, was, you know, in, in the, uh, the four-ish range. Uh, so I think after all, you know, after two months of consecutively increase in the unemployment situation, uh, the, the actual situation is more uh, dire than, uh, than the number suggests. Uh, so, you know, for the target of 10 million new jobs a day, you know, you have, you know, a couple of uh, million uh, new uh, university graduates uh, each year already. And, and on top of that, you probably have migrant workers coming back to the city. And, you know, because uh, going into the second quarter, uh, overseas, many overseas countries are basically locked down because of the virus spread. Uh, so what we're seeing is that the export uh, orders actually decline, and in some cases, it declined to zero. So you know, even though the March export number has been beating expectation, but I think going into the April and May into into the second quarter, I think the situation uh, for the export sector, uh, you know, would be quite difficult. So I would say that you know, in, in that regard, you know, to create 10 million new jobs, uh, considering you have a few million uh, new uh, university graduates, and plus uh, migrant workers not you know, being able to return to work, uh, I would say that it would be a big challenge for, uh, for the work in, in the second quarter. Mm -hmm. Professor Zhu Min, what's your take on that about the job prospects for uh, the Chinese, uh, either migrant workers and the graduates or even uh, people, the veterans, say? Well, I think there are two big pieces of uncertainty uh, on the picture. One is uh, what is the, the resumption of work going to look like? I and mean, we have uh, many parts of the eastern coastal region which are already I mean, going to pretty much uh, the normal state. And there's a lot of uh, migration workers going back to work. And, uh, but we also have to look at areas such as uh, Hubei province, the city of Beijing. I mean, there are still a, a sort of, some sort of uh, a lockdown still in effect and people are not uh, traveling uh, freely uh, into those cities. So I think that can still be a very big piece of uncertainty which we have to wait a little bit longer to see. The second big piece of information is well, even for those people who manage to go back to their work, they would still have to find the, the, the job opportunities. And it's not just a matter of China's domestic economy. I think a big part of China's economy is uh, export or is uh, oriented towards the rest of the world. And with the coronavirus situation still uncertain and developing in many parts of the world, I think that is also a big piece of uncertainty. So given those two things, I think, yes, it is very challenging and it is very uh, hard to tell how would the, the employment uh, situation look like in a couple of months, depending on all the variations. Mm -hmm. Well, we also collected uh, some comments and questions from social media. So, Professor Zhu, uh, let's take a look at the first question here. We have uh, on Chinese uh, Weibo, actually. Uh, there's a uh, Weibo user, a uh, small red beam, probably. Uh, ordinary people's money is tied up by housing prices with no income rise and high housing prices. 
where does the money come from for people to consume, to expand domestic demand? Uh, so Professor Zhu, so what do you make of uh, that question? Uh, yes, I have always been a very strong advocate for further uh, curbing policy on the real estate or on the further reforming of the real estate sector to start out with. But given how things are standing right now, I think there are two big things which the government could do at the moment. One is to continue and to expand the, the, the coupon program, the subsidy program, the program in order to uh, alleviate the poor uh, people from the poverty. And uh, I think in the, in the medium term, I think a big push from the government is, should be focusing on the uh, social welfare programs, programs which are going to provide uh, better facilities in terms of medical, educa uh, medical education and uh, social security. So I think if, e even if we cannot increase people's uh, income in, uh, in increase by very much, by restoring or by instilling the confidence into the consumer's mind by uh, making sure that they will enjoy those public goods in the future uh, at a reasonably uh, good level. I think that will also bring back the confidence from the consumers so that they are willing to and they can uh, have the courage and the confidence to consume more. And the consumption, as you said, uh, uh, is really critical to China's uh, economic rebound and uh, further growth. So I think it is really in the in, uh, interest of the entire nation for the government to do more things on um, improving the welfare of the household and improving the welfare, uh, the, uh, the standard of living of the consumers. Mm -hmm. Well, Hong Hao, we have one for you here. Uh, is Alvin, let's take a look. It's from Twitter, uh, the name of David uh, Kudla, the user. Uh, China's economy shrank 6.8% in the first quarter, but China's stock market resilient on the news. How do you make of that? somehow, I mean, there is a rise in the stock market despite of these uh, negative uh, numbers. Yeah, well, I think um, the Chinese market actually corrected before uh, the number came out. Uh, so uh, basically, you know, it went up to above 3,000 points and then come back down. And also, you know, keep in mind that um, the uh, country's stock market performance is highly correlated with how effectively a country is controlling the virus outbreak. I think China realized uh, the problem uh, very early uh, and also uh, used dr draconian measure uh, to, uh, to do the quarantine uh, for many of the Chinese cities. So I think you know, within a relatively short period of time, China was able to, to bring uh, the virus outbreak under control and gradually open up. And I think the progress uh, that China is making is actually substantially faster uh, than the rest of the world. And also, you know, in a way, it's, it probably is wrong to say that, but in a way, it's lucky uh, that, you know, we have this virus outbreak uh, during the Chinese uh, Lunar New Year, which tend to be a low season for uh, uh, Chinese economic activities. So then, you know, even if you have a, a very strong quarantine measure in place and many places stop working, uh, but you're not hitting the economy as hard as it did, for example, for the U.S. and, and for Europe. Uh, so I would say that for all those reasons, you know, because you, you were able to control the outbreak more effectively and also uh, the virus hit the country at a low season, uh, you know, therefore uh, the Chinese stock market is performing well, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Well, also, you know, many say the small and medium-sized enterprises in China are crucial in maintaining the resilience of the Chinese economy. Uh, and China has rolled out policies such as cuts in taxes and fees, financial support, and assistance for maintaining payrolls to help smaller firms. So Hong Hao, how do you, uh, what do you make of these measures? Are those measures enough to assist the Chinese economy, say, to gain a rebound in the second or third quarter? Well, I think for the time being, you know, that's probably, you know, as much as we can do, you know, for SMEs. Uh, but I think, you know, tax rebate and tax reduction uh, actually works with a substantial time lag, you know, in the sense that by the time you rebate the tax or, resu or, or reduce the tax to SMEs, uh, it's a little too late, you know, because many of us, you know, is actually facing a cash flow problem. Uh, and also, you know, for, for, for tax reduction, maybe some of the SMEs don't even have uh, the revenue to pay tax out, uh, to, to pay tax upon. So I would say that um, it is good, you know, to see policy roll out. You know, at least to a certain extent, it 
uh, support the confidence in, in the business community. But then at the same time, I think what the SME really needs uh, is uh, some cash flow relief, uh, some debt restructuring, or maybe you know, even debt forgiveness uh, from uh, the commercial banks. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's take a look at these uh, uh, predictions made by International Monetary Fund uh, and in their uh, very aggressive report here. The IMF suggests policymakers around the world should ramp up fiscal stimulus when the uh, coronavirus starts to abate. Uh, and also because it is the probably uh, the deepest, uh, uh, I mean the largest or the most uh, greatest depression probably uh, we, we have seen in 100 years. And so uh, what do you think about the Chinese response so far? Uh, people are talking about, you know, back uh, 20, uh, 12 years ago in 2008 financial crisis, there was this uh, stimulus package worth of 4 trillion yuan, and which is about 16% of the GDP, Chinese GDP. And so far, Chinese government had responded in a very moderate way. Uh. Yeah, is that a question for yeah, you? like you know, so oh, sorry. is it the time for Chinese government to respond more aggressively? Maybe not as large as a four trillion yuan uh, a stimulus package, yeah. but so far all those measures we have we have been seeing, uh, I would say, quite moderate. What do you make of that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think China is re responding with a, a measured pace. You know, after all, you know, the Chinese financial market hasn't been in a, a volatile situation as its overseas counterparts. Uh, and also, you know, if you look at the uh, Chinese business community, I think probably because uh, uh, the Chinese people have a very uh, 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 habitual way of saving. Uh, you know, the savings rate in, in China is about 40 to 50 percent. So, you know, it gives many Chinese business and, and families uh, the necessary buffer to survive this very difficult period. So all in all, you know, I don't see the reason why um, the PBOC needs to uh, ease monetary policy aggressively, uh, you know, as the Fed and the, uh, and the ECB does. Uh, and I think, you know, the most importantly is that if, if you look at the system, right, so the market interest rate level is actually declining. So what that means is that there is actually abundant uh, liquidity in the system uh, or the supply of liquidity is actually uh, greater than the demand for it. Uh, so, it, you know, the consequence is that the market industry level is actually falling down. So if you want to get a business loan, uh, it's actually probably uh, a good time to get it. So given that, given a relative stability in the financial market and also relative, relative abundance of liquidity availability in the system, uh, I would say that uh, China is actually responding it, uh, uh, to the crisis uh, in the right way. Uh, I think most importantly, uh, it's trying to target uh, the policy help uh, to uh, areas where it's mostly needed, uh, which is the SME sectors that we discussed just now. Mm -hmm. Well, we are also joined by Ian Bag, professor at the European Institute and co-director of the Darwin uh, Dorf Forum of the London School of Economics and the Political Science. Uh, so Professor Ian Bag, you know, we're talking about uh, the Chinese uh, uh, measures to help uh, the SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises. You know, we are also talking about you know whether China needs a stimulus package, which is as aggressive as like 12 years ago. You know, four trillion yuan over the year. Uh, so, what, what's what's your uh, take of the Chinese responses so far to the crisis? Well, I think it's correct to say that what China has been doing is in the right direction. The big challenge will tend to be on these kinds of measures, supporting, especially supporting small and medium-sized enterprises, is implementation. Can you make sure with such a huge population of companies that the fiscal stimulus that's being put in place will actually reach those who are most vulnerable? It's a huge logistical problem, an administrative problem, as well as one of macroeconomics. I think that uh, there is still some room in China for further uh, easing of monetary policy, which would help in, in, if credit is an issue. But I don't think credit is a fundamental one. It's, it's lack of demand from customers that's the major concern. And that's where you, you need some means of using fiscal support to, to deal with that lack of demand.
Mm -hmm. Well, compared with uh, other countries, uh, our regions, such as the U.S. and the Europe, you know, which uh, have already reduced interest rates uh, to zero or negative, I know people, just as you both have said, actually, China probably uh, does not need to cut its uh, interest further or, you know, uh, I don't know, like whether we need to also follow the steps of uh, uh, the European countries or the United States, you know, to cut the interest rate really low or even close to zero, Hong Hao. Yeah, probably Which not necessary right now. And also, you know, given... Yeah, Hong Hao, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, given that the inflation pressure is still on, uh, if you look at uh, the, the latest inflation figure, it's still in the 4% range. Uh, but I think going into the second half of the year, you know, you know, because of the subsiding of the uh, pork, pork price inflation pressure, uh, I would say the overall CPI is going to come down uh, from the 4% level. So then that way it gives uh, the, the PBOC more leeway. Uh, to ease interest rate. So I think for now, you know, people are actually looking for a reduction in, L, uh, in LPR, the loan prime rate, but the loan prime rate only affects the new loans. Uh, and because the loan prime rate uh, reform uh, happened uh, in last August, so I think uh, until August, uh, then uh, the, the new LPR, even if it's reduced, uh, is go going to affect the new and existing loans. Uh, but I think for now, even if you reduce uh, LPR and other forms of interest, uh, it's going to have a very marginal impact uh, on uh, the demand for credits. Mm -hmm. Well, as you mentioned about uh, you know the the uh, monetary policy, of course, uh, um, you know it's really about uh, in what way uh, it will respond effectively to help the real economy, Hong Hao. Uh, you know, this is also a topic people, uh, you know, uh, are interested in because, you know, there's a lot of complaint whether the small and medium-sized companies really get uh, the assistance uh, supposed to be there. What's, what's your idea Yeah, on well, I think for the longest time, mm. yeah, the, yeah. For, the, for the longest time, uh, the SMEs has been uh, operating, you know, sufficiently, uh, not entirely relying on uh, the credit system uh, in China. I think... Uh, it used to be that you know some of the SMEs uh, rely on the shadow banking to get credits, but then after the crackdown of uh, shadow banking, you know they, they use some other forms of financing, for example, short-term notes, short-term bank notes, and all that. Uh, so I think they get by, uh, and I think they are actually prosperous. They actually uh, provide a, a substantial part of uh, employment for China. Now, you know, going forward, you know, the problem is that you know. At times like this, you know, because SME is running into a cash flow problem and also they don't have collaterals uh, um, uh, to borrow money from banks, uh, they really need help. Uh, just now we discussed, you know, tax rebate, tax reduction is working too slowly for them. Uh, you know, we're talking about some targeted lending uh, for, for SMEs, and, uh, which is what we're doing right now. Uh, and also, probably um, uh, the government can reduce uh, transaction fees registration fees and other forms of administrative fees for them as well to help them uh, to alleviate the pressure on the cash flow and to help them survive this uh, difficult period. Mm -hmm. Well, the World Economic Outlook report by IMF predicts that the U.S. economy will contract by 5.9% and Eurozone economies by 7.5%. Uh, in 2020, but it predicts that uh, China will maintain a positive growth overall uh, f throughout this year, like by 1.2% uh, with the accelerated resumption of production activities. And Ian, uh, what do you make of this IMF's prediction about the global economy? Well, the trouble with predictions in such a strange environment is that they're based on the information we have today. It's worth recalling it's only three months since the IMF was expecting global growth of 3%. Now they're saying minus 3%. So that's a 6% turnaround just in the events of the last three months. Therefore, you have to be very cautious about accepting these predictions as they, as they stand now because we simply don't know what happens next on the health front. It looks like China is recovering in health terms, and that recovery in health terms is translating into a recovery in economic terms. It may therefore be that China bounces back very quickly. It's what we, we would call a, a V-shaped trajectory, sharp downward trend and then sharp upward trend after it. However, China is going to be affected by what's happening in the rest of the world, and that has knock-on effects. Other countries were slower to enter the health crisis 
and they are therefore slower to have the economic impact, which is, is going to hit later in the year. And that means that China's markets in the West are going to be severely hit, at least in the next quarter. And that is going to slow down China's potential for recovery. And that's in addition to it, the uncertainty surrounding whether there might be a fresh outbreak of the, the virus or whether there are going to be selective changes. One other thing that I'd add is that in, in many of the Western countries, services are a much more significant part of the economy than they are in China. China's manufacturing is about 30% of the economy. In the US, it's 11%. In France and the UK, it's under 10%. And those service sectors are the ones that are going to be locked down very badly as a result of the crisis because of interpersonal connections simply can't happen. So that suggests that it could be a longer period of recovery for countries which are more heavily service dominated and the V-shape might become a U-shape rather than one which is, promises a, a rapid recovery. Mm -hmm. What about the, uh, the prediction of the Asian economy, uh, Asian countries, uh, you know, the prediction from IMF is like zero growth in 2020. Uh, do you agree? Is that uh, too positive or too negative? Yin. Well, well it's, it's the same analysis. They, they're, they're basing this on what, what's been happening as a result of lockdown, looking at the policy responses being made by individual countries. The policy responses have been massive in Europe. They've been much smaller in most Asian countries up to now, but they may well look to, to expand that later. The IMF has received some application to something like 100 countries for financial assistance. So it may be there's a collective global effort on this. We simply don't know how bad the economic crisis will be until we get more data and don't know how much further the health crisis will extend also until we get more data. Mm -hmm. Well, Hong Hao, the prediction of China, uh, you know, like nine, more than 9% for next year. What about the long term fundamentals of the Chinese economic growth? Uh, are they you know, being changed somehow by the pandemic or are they remain there? Mm, well, I think most people would think that the pandemic is a one-off hit and probably is one to two quarter uh, impact on the Chinese economy. I think longer term, uh, the potential for growth is really determined by the productivity of the country uh, and also uh, by uh, productive factors that you put in into the uh, production process. So I think, you know, recently a very important reform, the factor reform uh, that is ongoing uh, in China and there's some more directive uh, policies uh, being announced in recent days uh, is trying to liberalize uh, a land transaction, for example, and also uh, uh, liberalize, uh, mobilize uh, um, Chinese labor uh, movement as well. Uh, so I would say that, you know, those are very substantial reform, even though the market in the near term does not appreciate the important importance of this reform. But I think over time, you know, with more and more details of this reform being released, um, I think the uh, productive uh, factors that you're putting into the productive uh, production process uh, is going to yield longer term results. And then uh, the Chinese market is going to appreciate this long term impact a lot more in the coming days. Well, many thanks uh, to Hong Hao and, uh, and Yin from London. With that, we are coming to the end of today's discussion on China's economy in the first quarter. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.